Welcome to Community West Church and Friends to Church in the Home Online. Pastor Vicki and I appreciate your choice to watch these sermons that I put together. They are inspired by the Holy Spirit and always based on God's Word. The Bible is not just a book. It's a physical representation of our Almighty God. In the Bible, we meet God's Son, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, King David, the Apostle Paul, and so many more. But God's Word is much more than just literature. He that abides in us also leads us and guides us through the truth of God's Word so that we can carry God's Word and His ways throughout the earth. Now before I introduce today's message, I want to remind you that our weekly scripture reading verses are no longer on Planning Center. I will provide a document for each sermon with all the verses uh, in order as they are represented or presented in each of the sermons that are um, now and then forward. However, you can still submit your prayer requests and announcements to communitywestchurch at gmail.com. I'll show you this slide again at the end of the sermon, I think, maybe, so you can send in your comments and observations. I will enjoy reading them. And now, back to the sermon series. This is the Sermon on the Mount, part 26, the narrow and wide gates. There are more than 7,000 languages spoken around the world today. Each of them, and all of them combined, make the world a very diverse and beautiful place. One language, Basu, is spoken only by eight people. Now I say this because the Bible that we read, the Holy Bible in English, is only one of those 7,000 languages, which means to me that there may be words and phrases birthed in languages more than 2,000 years ago, and yet we are able to translate them into contemporary languages fit for all people groups. I find it remarkable and amazing and frankly somewhat overwhelming that I speak only one language not counting speaking in the tongues of the angels. In my mind, I can see people holding on to their own languages, but also opening their hearts to the languages of others. What it comes down to is one word, daily. We must daily thank our Creator for His sublime persona and His mighty powers that hold together everything that lives, breathes, and aspires to bask in the light of our Creator's love. Open your heart. Stay on the path and listen for that still, quiet voice. So now, back to our regularly scheduled sermon for this week. Actually, it's for last week, but we're catching up. Our key verse for this message is Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. How then can we enter the kingdom of heaven? When you're looking to buy a house, what's the first thing you want to know about where your house will be? Well, I can answer that in three words, location, location, and location. People who are looking for houses are not just looking for the house. They're looking for the house in the perfect location, or at least in their expectations of the perfect location. Now, location is not just about the proximity of our home to schools and banks or shopping centers. Location is also about the quality of the neighborhood. You may not want to live next door to someone who has their RV on blocks in the front yard next to the old sofa and washing machine. You also may not want to live in a neighborhood where thieves have stolen the neighborhood watch signs. You may not want to live next to the guy who repairs tubas 24 hours a day. In Matthew 7, Jesus gave a very unexpected answer to this question. Now, this passage comes at the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Jesus describes the nature of his coming kingdom, and then he qualifies exactly who will enter his kingdom and how they will get there. You may think that you already know all the people who will live on your street in eternity. But Jesus issues three very serious warnings that determine who will spend eternity with him and who will not. 
Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught about the character of those in his kingdom, as we saw in his list of Beatitudes. Now, they are the poor in spirit, those who mourn over sin, the meek who submit to the Lord's leadership, their hunger for righteousness, and so on. Ultimately, this leads them to be persecuted. Matthew 5, verses 2 through 10 has been named the Beatitudes. In the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, this is what he said to us. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's go back again to verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Well, why? Why would somebody persecute um, someone who's blessed or blessed? Well, it's because of righteousness. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So why are they persecuted? Well, like I said, because of righteousness. These people who hunger for righteousness practice a somewhat higher standard of righteousness than the so-called spiritual leaders or the scribes or the Pharisees. Matthew 5, verse 20. Jesus says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, referring to the scribes, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, while hypocritical leaders are consumed with the outward appearances of religion, true kingdom citizens focus on the inward reality. Their disciplines are done to be honored by God, not by people. They continually confess and rid themselves of sin, seeking to help others to do the same. Here's the first six verses of Matthew 7. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and then tear you to pieces. So as we approach the end of the Sermon on the Mount series, Jesus gives his conclusion. It's the application of the sermon. He calls all who are listening to choose which path they will take, which kingdom they will be part of. And no one is born into God's kingdom, at least not by natural means. It does not matter if your parents were Christians, if they were baptized or dedicated as infants, because no one enters until they decide to enter. At the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he challenges his hearers because many would be tempted to simply just stand in amazement. Starting with verse 28, And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They don't labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. Now they would say to themselves, no one ever spoke like this. Love your enemies, bless and don't curse them. Many have admired Jesus' words throughout history. Because of his words, Jesus has been called a great teacher or prophet. However, few have heard these words, few who have heard these words, have truly felt the weight of them and been then pressed to decide which kingdom will I be a part of. Now there are two rival gates, two paths you can go by, leading to two rival kingdoms, but for now you just can pick one. What are the two rival kingdoms? Well, one is the kingdom of this world and the other is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus calls us to choose one of the pathways, and he gives us the characteristics of each 
so that we can make an informed and wise decision. Now this is very similar to the description of the two paths in Psalms 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Now the psalmist describes the pathway of the wicked that leads to description to destruction in the pathway of the right and the pathway of the righteous that leads to life. The righteous delight in God's word and meditate on it all day long. They become like trees that prosper in the various seasons of life. Now in the beginning of the worship hymnal of Israel, the psalmist calls worshipers to choose. True worshipers follow the pathway of the righteous and so do the true disciples of Christ. Now I like John MacArthur's comments on these two paths. John MacArthur is a reverend. He's a very successful pastor and leader of other pastors. Unfortunately, he does not support the idea of female pastors in the church. But having said that, here is what Reverend John MacArthur has to say about two systems of religion in the world. There have always been but two systems of religion in the world. One is God's system of divine accomplishment, and the other is man's system of human achievement. One is the religion of God's grace, the other the religion of men's works. One is the religion of faith, the other the religion of the flesh. One is the religion of the sincere heart and the internal, the other the religion of hypocrisy and the external. Within man's system are thousands of religious forms and names, but they are all built on the achievements of a man and the inspiration of Satan. Christianity, on the other hand, is the regulation or the religion of divine accomplishments, and it stands alone. Now the rest of this message will be about how to consider these two opposing pathways so that we can make a wise decision or wisely discern which one we are on. First, we must discern the characteristics of the two opposing pathways. Although Jesus' parabolic saying appears to picture a person at a crossroads, making a decision between two options, it seems best to picture that person standing in front of only one gate as the narrow gate needs to be found. Everyone belongs on the wide pathway. Scripture supports this. Matthew 7 verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. So what are the characteristics of a wide pathway? First, the wide pathway is the road we all begin on. Now, the rest of this message is going to focus on these two opposing pathways so that we can make a wise decision or wisely discern which one we're on. So let's start with that, the wide pathway. Let's look at the characteristics of this. Now, I said the first one. And now we've got all the rest of them have been in this. There should have been like four more or three. Here we go. The wide pathway is spacious and easy to follow. The wide pathway is popular. And the wide pathway leads to destruction. So we have a pathway that all begin on. We have a wide pathway that's spacious and easy to follow. And then we find out that it's popular which unfortunately leads to destruction. Now, the wide pathway is the road that all began on. The wide pathway is spacious and easy to follow. Let's keep that in mind. Now, although Jesus' parabolic saying seems to picture a person at a crossroads, making a decision between two options, it seems best to picture the person standing in front of only one gate 
as the narrow gate needs to be found. All belong on the wide pathway. The rest of scripture supports this. Matthew 7 verse 13, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. So what are the characteristics of a wide pathway? Well, the first characteristic of the wide pathway is that the wide pathway is the road we all begin on. Although Jesus' parabolic saying seems to picture this differently, um, making a decision between two options, I think it's best to picture the person standing in front of only one gate as the narrow gate needs to be found. All belong on the wide pathway. The rest of scripture supports this. Now the wide pathway is also spacious and easy to follow and the wide pathway is popular. But unfortunately, the fourth problem with the wide pathway is that it leads us to destruction. Let me get through these a little quicker. I wanted to get to Ephesians 2, 1. Here we go. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. And then Romans 8, 7, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So there are three verses here that outrightly describe why the wide pathway is the wrong pathway. And I'll relist them for you here for those of you that want to write them down or at least write the notes. Now remember, Jesus says that one must choose to enter the narrow gate. No decision needs to be made to enter the broad path. That's the pathway the entire world is on. We must choose to get off of that path. That leads us to point number two for some further insight. The wide pathway is spacious and easy to use. I'm sorry, to follow. Now, I took an excerpt here from a book called The Preacher's Outline and Sermon Bible. So I'm quoting from that book. The broad and easy way can be followed without thought. There is plenty of space to walk in. There is plenty of space for the attractive things of the world to grow and be allured to. There is plenty of space for a person to wonder about. It is difficult to wander off its path. The broad way is the way of the unthoughtful, the undisciplined, the lazy, the worldly, the ungodly, the materialistic, and the carnal. Now this pathway is very inclusive as it includes the various views, religions, and lifestyles in this world. It's the pathway of self-achievement and works. Now what does self-achievement and works eliminate? It eliminates the hand of God. The wide pathway is popular. Jesus tells us that if you find the narrow path, you will see that the wide pathway, the broad way, is not only popular, but very tempting. The crowds that traverse it, traverse it, make it seem very alluring. Those who don't follow it are locked down, are looked down upon, and they're considered strange, and they're often persecuted. That leads us to number four. The wide pathway leads to destruction. Destruction does not mean that those on the pathway cease to exist. They do not. All will live eternally, either in damnation or blessing. Destruction refers to eternal ruin. Matthew 8, verse 12. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 14, 11. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day nor night for those who worship the beast and its image, nor for anyone who receives the work, the mark, excuse me, of its name. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophets had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now this ruin does not just happen at the end of the pathway. It happens throughout. 
the world's views on marriage, parenting, education, success, etc., all lead to constant ruin. God made this world based on spiritual principles. When these are denied, it causes hurt, pain, depression, and even death. Now, the broad and easy way can be followed without thought. There is plenty of space to walk in. There's plenty of space for the attractive things of the world to grow and allure. There's plenty of space for a person to wander about. It's very difficult to wander off the path. The broad way is the way of the unthoughtful, the undisciplined, the lazy, the worldly, the ungodly, the materialistic, and the carnal. The pathway is inclusive as it includes the various views and religions and lifestyles in this world. It's the pathway of self-achievement and works. There is one additional attribute to the statement. It's the pathway of self-achievement. Now, the reason why I repeated this is because prior to what we just talked about, you hadn't been exposed to all the verses and such. Now you can see how it all fits in. However, this pathway is a roller coaster straight to hell. I couldn't find a roller coaster that went into hell, so it didn't work <coughs> Excuse me for my images. Now, in Romans 8, Paul writes in verse 6, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The wide pathway leads to, earth, to earthly and eternal ruin. So then what do we do? Well, we turn to the narrow pathway. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Now the narrow pathway refers both to the need for conversion and the continuing process of sanctification. So let's look at the characteristics of the narrow pathway. Number one, the narrow pathway is difficult to find. Unlike the broad way, the narrow way must be found as noted in verse 14 of Matthew 7. Now for some, this is easier than others. Some are raised in Christian homes and are exposed to the gospel from a young age. Others live in places with no gospel witness. Creation witnesses to them through God's existence, and through his glory. Unlike the broad way, the narrow way must be found as noted in verse 14 of Matthew 7. Like I said, for some, this is easier for others. Some are raised in Christian's home. They find out about it. It works out for them. Others learn it as they go along. That was me. I didn't really have much uh, interest in God and the church until I was 17. Uh, I met a, a girl in my class who was a Christian, and she invited me to a couple of um, uh, places where people spoke about God, and I hadn't ever seen anything quite like that. And one of those was a man, um, I won't mention his name right now because I, I'm likely to get it wrong, but he um, spoke across the country, and he was very moving, and he, he had a really good influence on those of us who were unsure about what we wanted to think about when it came to God. Here's what I like to think about when it comes to God. Um, Psalms 19 verses 1 to 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion racing to or rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. It's unfortunate that they lack the opportunity to hear biblical revelation. Others are exposed as Christians live in their society, but they um, have either been rejected or rejected God or not considered God at all. Now, whatever a person's situation is, the narrow way is not the easy one to find. 
Only a few find the narrow way, and even fewer choose the path. Now, reason number two, the narrow pathway, is unpopular. In life, people typically take the path of least resistance, which means that people are naturally inclined to follow the broad path of the world. To find and follow the narrow path, we must turn away from the crowd, sometimes even leaving friends and family to do that. Great preacher Alexander McLaren poetically declared that the side posts of the gate to the kingdom were the first beatitudes. One side post is poverty of spirit. And it's unfortunate that they lack the opportunity to hear biblical revelation. Others are exposed as Christians live in their society, but they've either rejected God or not considered God at all. Whatever a person's situation is, the narrow way is not the easy one to find. Only a few find the narrow way, and even fewer choose its path. Sometimes it is a lonely pathway, but those who follow it are never truly alone, because Jesus is always with them. Number three, the narrow pathway must be entered by deliberate and calculated choice. Now that seems almost evil in its own way, because the evil um, evil people are usually deliberate and calculated in what they're going to accomplish. But in this case, we want to deliberately and with great calculation choose to follow God. The great Again, we come back to Alexander McLaren's um, speech or poem. And apparently I decided that I wanted to write it twice. Ah, but I didn't. It says that Matthew 5 verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, to come before God, you must recognize your own spiritual bankruptcy, and you need a, you need to have a desperate need for God. I double needed that, but that worked. The one who comes to God does so to become righteous and acceptable to enter heaven. Now, the second side post is mourning over sin. Matthew 5, verse 4, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, because this person is far from being right with God, he mourns his sin and his desperate situation. It is this reality that causes someone to cry out to God for salvation. It causes him or her to choose to enter the kingdom of heaven's gates. In Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, Paul writes, If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. To enter this narrow path, we must make a deliberate choice. We must, in faith, accept that we are sinners under God's wrath because he is holy, he is perfect, and he is just. We must cry out for God's mercy, which is found in Christ. Now, Jesus bore the wrath for our sins so that we can have his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, Paul writes, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now those who accept him shall be saved. Jesus will walk with them along the narrow path of the kingdom, and God will take them into eternity. Number four, the narrow pathway is restricted because of biblical revelation. Now, God's word guides kingdom citizens. God's word is the gate as a person needs to hear and respond to the gospel to be saved. However, biblical revelation is also the pathway. It guides and, in some sense, it restricts both the believer's actions and attitudes. God's word keeps the believer from the broad path of the world. John 8, verses 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That brings us to number five. The narrow pathway requires believers to leave many precious things behind. Because the path is narrow, you cannot bring everything with you. Here's how it works. First, we must forsake our sins. In Ephesians 4, verses 22 to 24, 
Paul tells us that we are taught with regard to our former way of life to put off our old self. Excuse me, I gotta let my cat out for a minute. Let's start with Ephesians. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Well, in this passage, Paul calls us to put off our old self to be made new. Well, we can't just keep living in lust and anger and pride and the other vices any longer. We must put on love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and the rest of the virtues. To do that, we must put off our old self. As we saw in the Lord's Prayer, we must cry out for God's will to be done, not only in our own lives, but in this world. Matthew 6, verses 9 and 10. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I say those words so often, I just love to, to hear them. In Galatians 2, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We must give up selfish ambitions in order to have kingdom ambitions. We must give up the crowd and sometimes even our friends and families. Luke 14 verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now in the following statement, Jesus, who somewhat surprisingly declares that he did not come to bring peace. He came to bring a sword. Matthew 10 verse 34, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. The members of households would often become their own enemies. This was a sad reality, but following Jesus often separates us from our loved ones. To go down the narrow path, we must be willing to leave many precious things behind. The narrow pathway is difficult. It's difficult for many reasons. We will battle sin. We will fight against ungodly attitudes and actions. We must declare war against our bodies, plucking out our eyes and cutting off our arm, metaphorically, of course, to be holy. I think when we talk about this plucking and cutting off things, it really has to do with stopping your actions because it's not your arms and your hands fault what they do it's what your mind is thinking and if you can change what your mind is thinking your hands and arms will shape up and go right along with you let's continue on the narrow pathway here matthew 7 verses 13 and 14 enter through the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it Small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life, only a few find it. Narrow pathway refers both to the need for conversion and the continuing process of sanctification. Let's take a look at the characteristics of the narrow pathway here. Um, or not. Apparently, I must have left that on there when I didn't want it on there. So. Scratch that, and we'll come back to the next verse. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, and throw it away, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now I should mention 
that I went through this message several times and it was way too long. And then when I went through it again, it was almost way too long. And then I went through it about three more times and it came down to painfully long, but not way too long. So, and in doing this, I, I, we had a, a bunch of mechanical problems with what was going on, which is why this message got delayed uh, by seven days or however, whatever day of the week it is. And so it took me a while to catch up with that. And I wanted to go through and edit it, but I, I just don't have the time to do that. So just letting you know. Let's move on. Matthew 5, verse 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble, what do you do? Gouge it out, toss it. That's weird. It says gouge it out and throw it away. I could imagine some disciple like skimming it across the lake or something. That's weird. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Well, that's true. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. I agree with that. 548. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, following Jesus is a call to be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. But this fight against sin is not only to conquer our own sin, but also to help others conquer their sin as well. Matthew 7 verses 1 through 6. Do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now what I'm hoping for here, since we use this at the beginning, and then I've talked a bit about what's going on, and then we do it towards the end, you'll see how it all fits together. So coming back here to verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? I found a picture of that, by the way. It was a guy who had, um, was trying to get, he had a little thing in, in, in his brother's eye and he had this stick sticking out of his eye and he was too busy on his brother. So it was kind of funny, but it, it didn't really fit what I was, what I was working on. Back to this. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn in terror to pieces. And by the way, pigs can be really mean. In this passage, Jesus calls for his disciples to help others to take the specks or the splinters out of their eyes. This ministry is marked with much pain and frustration, both at ourselves and others when failing in the battle with sin. Pain also comes as others become angry at us because of our ministry to them. The narrow pathway is also difficult because of the hate and the persecution that we will commonly experience. In the last beatitude, Jesus said that kingdom citizens will be persecuted because of righteousness. Matthew 5, verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I chose a white background because it stands out from the black backgrounds we've had all this time. This verse is very important. Those of us who are persecuted because of our righteousness have to remember that their lying ahead is the kingdom of heaven. They will be persecuted because of their moral beliefs. Those on the broad path hate any restrictions that hinder their comfort. So you have two contrasts there. Or I guess it's one contrast. One is con the contrast is that the broad path, they hate the restrictions, whereas the persecuted are holding on to their beliefs. So to teach that adultery and, a, and abortion and homosexuality is a sin can cause an uproar in many societies around the world, but also simply because one chooses to not participate in acceptable sins like sex before marriage or drunkenness or whatever, many will mock believers for that. So when you get on the pathway, the narrow pathway, yeah, it's a difficult and narrow pathway. Paul said that in, when in, his, in his epistle to Timothy. He says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus 
will be persecuted. Ouch. What if, what if I didn't know that ahead of time? Well, that's why we tell people, if you go down this path, you're going to be persecuted. And you should know that and find out that it's really worth it if you are. The broad road is easy, but the narrow way is very difficult. Number seven, the narrow pathway leads to life. Although it is difficult, this pathway does lead to life. To enter it is to experience new life. John 17, verse 3, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So kingdom citizens, uh, even though they're hated and mocked by the world, they have a greater quality of life because of intimacy with God. There can be peace in the midst of the storm and joy in the midst of hardship. Hang, hang on one more second. What do, you, what do you want? Making so much noise. John 17, verse 3. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Kingdom citizens, though they've been hated and mocked throughout the world, have a greater quality of life because of intimacy with God. Now, there can be peace in the midst of the storm and joy in the midst of hardship. John 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I believe that as we walk with Jesus, we will find that, that this difficult path will be much easier to follow. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse, starting with verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Ultimately, those who follow this narrow path will spend eternity in the heavenly kingdom. They will rule with Jesus on this earth. Matthew 5, 5. Blessed are the meek for they will, that's right, inherit the earth. Now it's time to look at some applications from what we've learned in this message. Number one, Jesus' call to follow the narrow path reminds us of our need to teach people about the costs of following Jesus when presenting the gospel. Jesus was not like many modern evangelists and revivalists who boast how simple and easy the gospel is. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many, many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus calls people to count the cost. Luke 14, verse 25 through 34. The cost of being a disciple. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate mother and father, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, and saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything that you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, 
but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? While the narrow road is difficult to find, and equally, whoops, <laughs> I was scrolling down and it didn't work. The narrow road is difficult to find and equally difficult to follow. You cannot bring everything with you. Jesus calls for people to consider this reality. However, with this hard road, there is life. I know we must share what follow, that, uh, that following Christ brings eternal life. But we also must share that it is a costly road. It may even cost people their lives. Jesus' message reminds us to present the full gospel without sugarcoating it. If the Lord has called them, they will respond. John 6, verse 37. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. Point number two. Jesus' call to follow the narrow path reminds us of the importance of asking for a decision when presenting the gospel. Moses laid before Israel a blessing and a curse as he challenged them to follow God. Deuteronomy 11, verses 26 through 28. Moses said, See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today. The curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods which you have not known. Joshua did the same as the call for Israel to choose who they will serve. Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Now Elijah asked Israel who they would follow, Baal or God. 1 Kings 18, 21. Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. We must not be frightened of the prophetic or to be the prophetic. We must plant the seed of the gospel, but we must also ask people to decide. Acts 2, verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, that brings us to the third and final point. Number three, Jesus' call to follow the narrow path reminds us of the importance of application in our teaching and study of the Bible. Verses 13 and 14 of Matthew 7. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many, many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This passage marks the beginning of the conclusion and application of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus taught the character of the kingdom and its citizens, and he now calls for a commitment. In the same way, biblical teaching must not just disseminate knowledge. It must also challenge people to action. Paul taught Timothy to devote, him, to devote himself to exhortation and teaching. 1 Timothy 4, verse 13. Until I come... Devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. So Paul taught Timothy to devote himself to exhortation and teaching. Exhortation, or preaching, is the application, and call to the obedience part of the message is the sermon. Similarly, as we study the Bible, we must not just aim to understand, but also to obey. James 1, verse 22. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. So, I, 
didn't get, I, I, I remember now what happened exactly. Uh, we had something happen at the door and I came out and came back in and I forgot to change these to match my text. Anyway, you get the point. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, it's important that we study God's word to apply it to our lives and so that we can also share it with others. Jesus' call to enter the narrow gates gives us an example for both our teaching and the study of the Bible. And that brings us back to our key verse, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Well, how then can we enter the kingdom of heaven? There are only two pathways, one leading to destruction and the other leading to life. One is readily found, the other must be searched for. One is popular, the other is unpopular. One is easy, the other is difficult. Choose wisely, for your eternal destiny depends on this choice. So which will you choose? The Sermon on the Mount, Part 26, The Narrow and Wide Gates. Um, we have a, what, what we're trying to do here is get a little bit of uh, financial flow going through, keeping it going for some of the things that, that, that we have to do here. Submit your prayer requests and announcements to communitywestchurch at gmail.com. And that's the end of the message. Um, so now I'll pray. Let me put that back up. Oh, wait, there it is. Now you can see it. There we go. Just remember, if you, um, before I pray, uh, remember that if you need anything from us, if you have any questions, if you um, uh, want to submit or you want to um, provide some in, in, uh, offerings or gifts to us, um, we're very, um, I'm trying to think of the word, grateful. <laughs> to have that happen. So it's communitywestchurch at gmail.com. Um, I'm going to show this slide, by the way, at the end of the balance of my uh, of the sermon in all my comments and observations and uh, in, in the future uh, messages as well. Just to kind of remind us that if we're a church, um, there is a little bit of, of money that needs to be spent for things here and there. Um, okay. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your inspiration for this message. Um, I'm not real excited about the, the um, difficulties we had with our technology, but I don't blame any of that on you. I just appreciate that um, my oldest son is able to put this kind of stuff together and help us out. Um, I thank you for all those who listen to this and for all those, uh, the families and such that are uh, visiting other churches these days, uh, it's understandable why that's happening. It's okay. And for those who want to um, get a double batch of, of, uh, of the Bible, go ahead and listen to my messages as well. I appreciate that. And if you have any questions or if you have any topics that you'd like me to cover in future sermons, um, go ahead and submit those, and we'll take those on. And I'm praying in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.